Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Good to be here. Good to be with the awesome Hilo Church. Legendary Hilo Church. Um, and it's been uh, incredible just being here already. We got to spend some great time with uh, disciples, uh, you know, yesterday. And uh, we went to Kona on Friday, which was really fun. And I uh, got to hang out there. And, um, and so I'm grateful to be with the Hilo family, grateful to be able to talk and uh, speak and uh, just do a, an awesome, awesome Bible study uh, that actually really changed my life uh, about 15 years ago. Um, and it's called A Jealous God. Sounds pretty radical, huh? And uh, let's get our Bibles out. We'll, uh, let's open up to Isaiah 9. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Just jump right into it here. Isaiah chapter 9. And uh, we'll pick it up in verse 1. If you know, uh, in the book of Isaiah, one of, the, one of the great things, if you've read it, I'm sure we've all read it, is, is that it's a very prophetic book. And it talks about Jesus, and it talks about uh, who he is, and we find different descriptions even of Jesus that he was like a dry root, you know, and not very attractive, you know, but it was his convictions that really started an awesome movement, amen? So I was really inspired when I read that myself to know that uh, there's hope no matter uh, if you look like Jeremy or not, amen? Um, just kidding, bro, just kidding. Roz really balanced Jeremy out in an incredible way. Uh, they're celebrating their 20th anniversary, which is incredible. And, uh, and they decided they'd come to Hilo and uh, hang out with us and with the church for their 20th anniversary. And I don't know a more committed uh, a married couple than somebody who had decided to do that. Uh, so we really love you guys a lot. Okay. Uh, anyway, all, in all seriousness, let's pick it up at verse 1 as we see about Jesus and the prophecies right here. It says, uh, nevertheless, verse 1, there will be no more gloom. For those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he'll honor Galilee of the nations. By the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Amen. Amen. And uh, let's pick it up in verse 6. Continue here. It says, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he'll be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He'll reign on David's throne. And over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Amen? Amen. You know, you do see the prophecy of Jesus. Awesome. Uh, you see the, the fact that God's plan was to send Jesus to bring the light to such a dark and hopeless world. And, uh, and even Brittany's incredible communion is just shocking to see. And I looked at the picture and I just, you know, I, I was like, you barely even recognize the girl. She's like, I think this is, you know, so-and-so. And you're like, maybe. But then for that to be her, I mean, you just see, it's a land of darkness. Yeah. That Satan is just, he just, man, he just wants to rip us up. He just wants to divide us, tear us up, chew us out, up. And, and he, he does it with very attractive things, you know, very attractive things. But we don't realize those attractive things in the end lead to darkness, you yeah. know. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's awesome to have the Bible and to have Jesus who gives us that light to know that sometimes those attractive things are, are not from God. They're from Satan himself. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and it's awesome that we're in the kingdom and we're, be, we're, we're fighting for those things. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's incredible. There's a church at Hilo. Yeah. There, there's a hope for the, the great city of Hilo right here, you know? And uh, you don't realize how great it is until you're here. You're like, man, this place is awesome. Uh, every time I come, I feel like I'm, like, restored to sanity in some ways, you know, because it's just, it's just a beautiful place, beautiful people. 
Uh, and of course, my favorite food is here, Hawaiian Style Cafe, I think oh, is yeah. a, my number one. I'm telling you, I found there's a Kuhio Grill out there in uh, Oahu now. And uh, it's this little hole-in-the-wall place, but I go there and it's the, the three sisters who own Kuhio Grill. They switch and they stay in Oahu for two weeks. So the girls who are at Kuhio Grill running it are also running the one in, uh, right next to UH, uh, Manoa out there. So anyway, but, you know, it's just incredible just to be here in Hilo. And, uh, of course, me and Brittany love the Kellys so much. It's so We're so sad they're sick. We're like, oh, like the, we're here and then they can't come. So, But we're going to bring a cool – we got a really cool birthday gift for uh, Titus that we're going to bring out. Or for Luke, sorry. Um, but it's awesome that Jesus has brought us the lights. It's awesome to be in a church that's bringing the lights, you know, and, uh, and just to see the baptisms that have already been, I mean, I've been watching from afar, but to finally meet Mark and to meet Quinn and to meet Daryl, uh, it's just fired up. So exciting. And, uh, and we're so excited for the future. I mean, we're right now in Honolulu, we're planning to send out the Maui mission team, you know, and, uh, and that's just such an exciting moment because it's like, you know, the Maui mission team has been talked about for years. And so finally we're like, all right, now we're going to plant a church there, you know? Uh, so it's just great to be in the kingdom of God. But at the very end, it says, what's going to accomplish all this? And it's so interesting. It's something that we don't normally see. We always think it's like, oh, strategy or great planning. But instead, what it says at the end of verse 7 is, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Is that interesting? And zeal is a very powerful attribute. And that's what I want to focus on in our lesson today is, is zeal. Right? And of course, you know, the older disciples are like, oh yeah, zeal. But Proverbs 19 do. Zeal without knowledge is, is, is worthless. You know what I mean? And yeah, that's true. That's true. But we're going to look at God's zeal. And, uh, and also what that means in a very spiritual way. What is this whole thing about zeal? What does it look like on a, on a biblical level? I think, you know, I've seen guys just think zeal is just yelling at the top of their lungs and just being psycho all the time. You know what I mean? And, and maybe I thought that for a while, too, and, and uh, you know, had to get discipled, maybe, you know, P- possible. But, uh, but zeal is an attribute, and zeal is an incredible thing, isn't it? Have you, ever, have you ever eaten food that you didn't like because somebody was zealous for it? Is that crazy? Like, somebody's zeal made you eat something disgusting. That's how powerful zeal is, right? I don't know. I don't know what that might be, you know, but, but I've had some... I, what's the crazy? I mean, I've had balut in the Philippines. You know what that is? That's like a half-cooked embryo of a chicken. And you like suck it out of the egg. And, and, and I was like, people are zealous about it. And they're so zealous. I'm like, I got to try. I got to eat this half-eaten embryo. You know what I mean? Like, that's insane. I hope I'm not offending anybody right now. Has anybody like had balut for breakfast this morning? And I've already lost you. Amen. All right. Okay. Brianna had some this morning, right? No? Okay. <laughs> She's going to have it for lunch, guys. Sorry. Have you ever watched, like, I, one time I watched this movie called Sophie's Choice. And there's a preacher who preached about it. One of my favorite preachers is like, and then in Sophie's Choice, she had to make the choice. And I was like, man, I got to watch this movie. Like he devoted a whole sermon to it. And me and Brittany sit there and we literally felt like we wasted like three hours of our life. It was the worst 80s movie I'd ever seen. It was painful. And, and I was trying to understand, like, what is God trying to tell me? And, and I think the point was that because somebody's zealous, you'll watch a three hour movie, even if you hate it. You know what I'm talking about? And I think, you know, zeal gets us to do things and attracts people and gets people to try things they don't, don't normally want to do. Probably the reason why you came out to church if you got invited was because somebody else was zealous about it. And you're like, man, they're so fired up about this church, I got to go check it out. You know what I mean? And, uh, and that's what attracted me. I'm like, these guys are crazy about this place. You know what I mean? Like, what is going on? And you're like, I'm, and, and you feel confused, like, what am I missing? Because they're so fired up about it, and I'm not feeling that. And there's a lot of them that are fired up about it. And they're normal people. They're not like crazy. Like they're, they have a normal life, and I respect their lives. And, and they're just excited. Like, what is it? And it made me try to learn about the church. And actually, once I started seeing it, I was, I was really fired up now, you know? And then what's cool is that, that that started getting other people who I'm talking to to come out to church as well. You know, so the zeal starts to change lives because they, because of, it attracts people. Even if they don't want to wake up early and come out on a Sunday, your zeal alone sometimes encourages them to do that. Amen? And so 
the point, first point is zeal is an attribute of God. We see that the zeal is going to accomplish this incredible light that comes to this world. It's zeal that, does it, does, that made that happen. And, and a, an interesting thing in Hebrew, Hebrew, uh, the word zealous is also the same word as jealous. So when I say God is a jealous God, now you have to understand a very important aspect of zeal. It's being zealous is synonymous with jealous. So here we're going to start to see like, why? How does that work? Because I think this is the kind of zeal God wants us to have, like, like this inter- in- interesting jealousy. And so we'll see God, like, like it says in the Bible, God is a jealous God, which means a zealous God is also a jealous God. So let's look at why in Ezekiel chapter 16 right here. All right. Ezekiel 16. In verse 1. And we're going to pick this up and what we're about to look at is, is, is a allegory of Israel, of God's people. And he's going to illustrate everything through a very graphic story right here. Verse 1. It says, The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, confront Jerusalem with her detestable practices. And say, this is what the sovereign Lord says to Jerusalem. Your ancestry and birth were in the land of of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. And so God's people, uh, just to understand that background, they, they they had a conquest of Canaan. And so we sing like sometimes to Canaan's land, I'm on my way. Uh, Canaan was the promised land. And so when they're referencing those two places, Amorites and, uh, you know, the land of the Canaanites, uh, that's what that place is. The people were a nation in Canaan. Okay, verse four. On the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to make it clean, nor were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in cloths. No one looked on you with pity or had compassion enough to do any of these things for you. Rather, you were thrown out in the open field, for on the day you were born, you were despised. Intense, huh? So Israel, when they were coming about, they were a nation in in slavery in in Egypt. They went into the desert. Nobody cared about them. And so that's what God's saying. He says, nobody cared about you guys. Except what we'll see is God. Let's keep going. Verse 6. Then I passed by you and saw you kicking about in your blood. And as you lay there in your blood, I said, you live. I made you grow like a plant of the field. You grew and developed and entered puberty. Your breasts had formed and your hair had grown, yet you were stark naked. Graphic, right? You know, it says, you know, God basically allowed Israel to live, watch them grow up, and watch them grow up into what we'll see later, a beautiful woman. Verse 8. Later I passed by, and when I looked at you, I saw that you were old enough for love. I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your naked body. I gave you my solemn, solemn oath and Entered into a covenant with you, declares the sovereign Lord, and you became mine. Is that awesome? You know, it, it kind of reminds you of like uh, Boaz and Ruth's account, you know, where Boaz spreads his garment over Ruth to claim her as his wife. And it, that's kind of how God is describing the heart for his people. He's saying, I, I am claiming you like a husband claims his wife. And this is a covenant. This is a loyal ba- bound that we have. God in God's people. Is that awesome? Yeah. It's a love like a marriage. And so that's how God wants us to know his, his love for us is, is a marriage type of love. A love that's eternal. A love that is, is deeper than anything else. And he's like, I made my oath. I married you. You're mine. And of course, we know when you get married, what do you say? For better, for worse, forsaking all others. Nobody else, right? You're not like, yeah, but I, I still have, you know, that one relationship that, can I keep that one? No, there's nothing else, right? That's the relationship, verse 9. I bathed you with water and washed the blood from you and put ointments on you. I clothed you with an embroidered dress and put sandals of fine leather on you. I dressed you in fine linen and covered you with costly garments. I adorned you with jewelry. I put bracelets on your arms and a necklace around your neck. And I put a ring on your nose and earrings on your ears. So there was a, 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 a millennial right here, you know. Um, <laughs> And a beautiful crown on your head, you know, so pretty cool. It's come back around in style. So you were adorned with gold and silver. Your clothes were of fine linen and costly fabric and embroidered cloth. 
Your food was honey, olive oil, and the finest flour. You became very beautiful and rose to be a queen. You know, so right here we see that God made Israel his wife, but not just that. What else did he make Israel? A queen. You know, he, he raised her up. He raises people up into this incredible, incredible place. And the, if you know the, you know, how that happened under David and under Solomon, that's, you know, the history of the Israelites. Verse 13. Uh, we just read that. Uh, verse 14. And your fame spread among the nations on account of your beauty, because the splendor I have given you made your beauty perfect, declares the sovereign Lord. But, uh-oh, taking a turn right here. But you trusted in your beauty and used your fame to become a prostitute. You lavished your favors on anyone who passed by and your beauty became his. You took some of your garments to make godly high places where you carried on your prostitution. You went to him and he possessed your beauty. You also took the fine jewelry I gave you, the jewelry made of my gold and silver. And you made for yourself male idols and engaged in prostitution with them. Verse 20. And you took your sons and daughters, whom you born to me, and sacrificed them as food to the idols. Was your prostitution not enough? You slaughtered my children and sacrificed them to the idols in all your detestable practices and your prostitution. You did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare, kicking about in your blood. You know, right here you see God. You see God as a, a hurt God, an angry God. And what you see is because Israel was his wife, his queen that he had raised, you don't just see that. But you see God, in the perfect sense, a jealous God. Yeah. And remember, a jealous God becomes a zealous God. Right. And I think a lot of people don't understand that call to be zealous. Because here we have to see zealous, real zeal, zealous is jealous. It's a relationship. God raised us into this incredible marriage with him, in a sense. Incredible love. We took a covenant. We said, no more idols. No more lovers. Forsaking all of them. And then God says, but, but Israel, you guys forgot. You forgot about what I did. And you went, you went to all the idols surrounding you and you you let other lovers into our marriage right here and you can understand god's like i'm feeling so much so ticked off i'm so protective i, I want to fight for you because you're my people and and we see now what zeal is because we understand god's jealousy amen, amen. and uh you know, I mean, even even for us, I mean, we have we've had relationships that have gotten messed up. You know what I mean? Uh, for me, I mean, uh, it's it's was bound to happen. But like a high school relationship, you know, where you're like, you, you you find some you know pretty awesome charismatic woman in high school, and and you're like, I like her, and we're gonna be together for the rest of our lives. You know what I mean? We're in ninth grade, but this <laughs> is my plan. <laughs> And there's, there's nobody else. There's never in my life, I'm 14 years old, there's, there's nobody that's ever going to be better than this person. This is it. I found them, you know? And, and, and it goes awesome. You know, it's like usually going to take about a week, like a great first week, you know? And then, and then two weeks into it, you're like, you're starting to go through some troubles, you know what I mean? You're like, this is tough, you know? I didn't know relationships were like this. And I've got to hold her hand in the hallway and all those things. And, you know, it's awkward. And what about my old friends, you know, and all this stuff. I have to sit with her on the bus. You know, it's intense. I didn't count that cost. And, and then, you know, it starts to go sideways. You know, I remember there was one girl I was dating and then 
then I'm like fired up about her and, and then find out that she's hanging out with her old boyfriend at her old boyfriend's house, you know? And I'm like, I'm like ticked off, you know what I mean? And I'm like, what about our covenant? <laughs> and it wasn't like a spoken one. It's like, we're, we're all supposed to know it, you know? And, um, and so, you know, I got crushed and heartbroken and angry. And, uh, but I have to understand, you know, when that happens, the relationship was over. It was wrecked, you know what I mean? On a very small scale. And amen, you know, it was, it, we were able to get past it. It took, you know, another two weeks to recover. <laughs> but, you know, even a high schooler understands how depressing it is when that happens. You know what I mean? But I think we got to look at God and understand it's on such a higher level. God, why does God get upset? You know, I, for me, when, when I heard this lesson, this lesson was preached to me as a fall away. I was sitting in the church. And, and the preacher, this was Kip at the time in LA, was preaching these, these, this is his sermon. After I got restored, I wrote the whole sermon out so I could preach it myself. And I'm sitting there and I'm hearing this. And I'm like, I've always thought God was angry at me because I was disobeying him. Because he felt disrespected. You ever feel like that? Yeah. Like God must be ticked off at me because I am disrespecting the Bible right now. And I had fallen away. I was living with a girl. Uh, we were immoral. I mean, there, it was just an intense, horrible situation. Uh, I, you know, I had just completely departed from what I knew the Bible was to say. I had fallen away. And so I'm sitting there and I hear this and he's, and he's talking about God, you know, is jealous. God raised us into marriage. He expected us to not have anything else more, than, more important than him. And understanding when when we, we, we deep, when we let anything else in our life, he's like, you forgot what I did for you. You forgot our relationship. We don't understand why God's angry. He's upset, not because he's feeling disrespected, but because like a husband is protective of a wife who's flirting with other guys, God is protective of us when we're messing around in the world. He's like, there's not to be any other idols. And we understand that with a marriage relationship, but not with God, not with God, which is the closest relationship we should have above everything. And we can start to look at Christianity and and instead of it being that relationship, what does it become? Just a set of rules. I got to check this one off. I got to check this one off. I got to check this one off. And and if you're around and and you lose that relationship, discipleship starts to become, how can I avoid getting discipled? All right, I gave my contribution, had my quiet time, shared my faith with someone, had a visitor out a few weeks ago. Okay, I'm good, right? You know, like usually like if you can do all those, you fly under the radar. And sometimes when you've been a disciple 10, 15, 20, 25 years, you're like, if I do those things, nobody disciples me. That means I'm going to heaven. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, we have to understand Christianity is not a set of rules. It's a marriage relationship with God. It's first a relationship. Sometimes it gets stretched. Sometimes you're not close. But you never allow other idols in that relationship. No other lovers. It's you and God to the end. Amen? Let's look at how great God is. Let's go to uh, verse 59. All right. All right. So, bro. Come on. It says, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will deal with you as you deserve because you've despised my oath by breaking the covenants. You know, is that intense? Sometimes we wonder, man, why does it get hard when I get far from God? For me, I had left the church. Why does it get hard when I'm like that? God's ticked off. You know what I mean? He's like, I'm not going to make life easy for you when you leave. It gets hard. Yeah. Not because he's mad, but because he doesn't want you to get confused. Right. He's like, I love you. You're mine. We made a covenant. You said Jesus is Lord. Yeah. Best day of God's life for your life, at least. Amen. And he's like, that was, that was it. That was, that was our marriage day. And so now, now I'm protective of you no matter what. You, you leave 
I'm going to let you know that I want you back. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to let you know that that's not the place I want you. I'm not going to make it nice. It's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. You're going to wonder why it's so hard. Because God says, you're mine and you're mine till for forever. And I'm going to fight for you. And so that's what God does. Verse 16, let's keep going. He says, yet I will remember the covenant I made with you in the days of your youth. And I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Then you'll remember your ways. And be ashamed when you receive your sisters, both those who are older than you and, and those who are younger. I'll give them to you as daughters, but not on the basis of my covenant with you. So I'll establish my covenant with you and you'll know that I am the Lord. Then when I make atonement for you for all you've done, you'll remember and be ashamed and never again open your mouth <laughs> because of your humiliation. Whoa, declares the sovereign Lord. So God says, you know what? Here's my deal. I want to take you back. I want you back with me. And, it, and it's not a trial run. It's not like, oh, I'm not sure. No, no, I'm going to take you back and I'm going to establish a covenant but it's going to be a covenant that's everlasting. Is that awesome? And he says, I'm going, to, I'm going to show you so much love that you're just going to never, ever again say anything negative or bad about this life with me because you're going to know how much I love you. You're never going to grumble. You're never going to complain again. Is that amazing? Yeah. And so, you know, when you understand that God is a zealous God means he's a jealous God, what does that mean? He doesn't want parts. He's not interested in part of you. He's not interested in and you just checking in on Sunday. God wants everything. He's like, I want every part of you. And he deserves it. He made us beautiful. He fixed us up. He gave us a purpose. You know, a lot of us, we've experienced getting married in the kingdom. You know what I mean? Pretty awesome when you get to do that. And some of you haven't, but it's going to be great when you do. Amen? Amen. And, uh, you know, it's incredible to see this. I think for me, it, it was, I, I listened to that lesson when Kip preached that. And I left. And a few nights later, I went to a going away party uh, for, for my, my girlfriend that I was dating. And, I mean, I knew I wasn't a disciple but I was still praying in the morning and talking to God. You know what I mean? And, and I was like, you know, wow, what an interesting lesson. I always thought God was upset because I was disrespecting him. Now I realize God is a jealous God. And because I'm now living with my girlfriend and doing whatever I feel like doing as a fall away, God is ticked off because we used to have a relationship. That makes sense. You know I mean? It's very cerebral to me, right? I was like, oh, great, great insight, Skip. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and then I go, and I go to a going away party at a wine bar, and there's my girlfriend, and we're saying bye to all our employees, and, and then I'm, I'm hanging out with some friends, and I go, and, you know, I'm walking, like, to the bathroom or something, and, and then there's my girlfriend flirting with uh, one of the, the coworkers, like, touching his head and his hair and all that. I'm like, get a little ticked off. You know what I mean? And, uh, and I, like, tell her, I'm like, stop. Stop touching this guy. This guy's, like, known for, like, hitting on girls, promiscuous, all that stuff. I'm like, stay away from that dude. She's like, oh, okay, sorry. So, you know, cool. Everything's settled, going around. Hour later, I see her hiding on like a side of the bar, like flirting with him again and like doing all this stuff. And, and I was like ticked. I was, I was mad. And I, was, I came up to her like, stop it. I'm sick of this. Stay away from him. You know what I mean? Um, and then she's like, okay, sorry. And I was like, I'm out of here. And I, and I lived like an hour away. I'm like, I'm driving home right now. And so I just took off. She's like, well, can I still go hang, hang out with them afterwards? And so I was like, whatever. I don't care. I'm going home. So I go home. It's like super late, 2, 2 a.m. And then I, I fall asleep, wake up. I'm alone at the house. You know, she had stayed with whatever after party they had there. And, uh, and I go to the beach where I'd been praying. And I just go and I'm praying on the rocks right, in, right at the ocean. And I'm just like, so angry. I just go to God like, Father, I was like, God, I am, I feel so mad. I'm so jealous right now. And that's when it clicked. Like I'm praying, I'm praying about this girl I'm living with in, in sin, right? And how jealous I am that she would flirt with another guy. And I felt all this, this just like confusion and anger and helplessness and hopelessness and how do I save it? Can I save it? What's going to happen? And, 
And then that's when it clicked. That's exactly how God feels about me right now. And it wasn't it wasn't in my head anymore. It was, I was like, oh my gosh. And and that was the moment. I was like, I am never ever going to make God feel like this ever again. I can never do this to God. So like right there on that jetty, right with the waves coming, I was like, I'm never going to ever leave you ever again. I'm loyal to the end. So I get, I go and have uh, lunch with my my girlfriend at the time when she gets back. And I, I'm, we sit down and say, hey, this is very, very tough. This is not easy. Uh, this is a huge sacrifice for me. But I need to let you know I can, I'm can. i no longer going to be living. We're not going to live together. I have to move out because I need to seek God. I need to make God number one. You know what I mean? I'm like, this is tough. And, you know, I'm expecting her to say, yeah, this is very hard. I don't know how I'll handle it. You know, what do I do? I mean, I'm going to lose you. You know, this is crazy. Are you serious? That's what I'm expecting. I'm like, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> and she looks at me and she says, well, Jesus sacrificed for you. You need to sacrifice for him. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, and, you know, this was a, a, like, I was a disciple. I grew up in the church. You know what I mean? And, and here, like, you know, this, this woman who I'd been dating and you know, awesome, awesome person, you know, uh, now tells me something that I should have known my whole life. You know what I mean? It was like a slap in the face from God right there. And literally, I started, like, just weeping. I couldn't stop crying. Like, it was the weirdest, craziest thing in that restaurant. I'm just like, ah! <laughs> ah! <laughs> I'm just crying. And, and, and it, it's, it was like the uppercut that I was like, you know what? She's right. Like, there's no amount of sacrifice. What am, who am I to, like, go before the cross? And all of God's love for me. All of his sacrifice for me. And I'm like, hey, God, this is really tough. But uh, I'm going to move out of the apartment that I'm living with with my, my girlfriend right now. You know what I mean? But that was my heart. I was like, I am so out of touch right here on sacrifice, you know? And he literally, God shut my mouth. Like, from there on out, I was like, I am ashamed and I'm never going to open my mouth again about the sacrifices I have to do for the love of God. You know what I mean? Like, wherever you send me, whatever it is, whatever amount I got to give, whatever mission field you put me on. Uh, wherever I'm sent, whatever people, you know, are discipling me or I'm discipling, uh, there's never again will I open my mouth. I'm so grateful. Jesus sacrificed for me. I get to live for him now. I get to sacrifice for him. And that was, uh, you know, 17 years ago. And it was awesome. And uh, I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for that lesson in that sermon. Amen. And um, so it was incredible. That's God's zeal for us. Now, Let's put it into Jesus and see Jesus' zeal in John chapter 2. It says in uh, verse 13. So we have the zeal of God. The second point is the zeal for God. And in John uh, 2.13, it says, When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remember that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. You know, I think uh, seeing God's zeal for us, number one, should, should make us zealous for him. And when we're zealous for him because of his love, we don't grumble or complain anymore. You guys with me? Like you're so fired up. You're so grateful. You're so zealous. It's like newlyweds. Newlyweds are not usually getting in fights. You know what I mean? Unless like something crazy happened. But a newlywed is like, I'm so grateful. This is so awesome. I, they're perfect. You know what I mean? And then, and then you kind of start to realize they're not. But at first, it's amazing. That needs to be our hearts in our relationship with God. Amen. And I think the first thing is, do you find yourself grumbling? And you got to research grumbling because God was not very fired up when his people grumbled. 
If you know Exodus, he sent out some snakes their way when there was some grumbling right there. Amen? And uh, why? Because God's like, I love you so much, why is there grumbling happening? You know, also, when you're, when you're fired up about God's zeal for us, and, and we're also feeling that zeal, it, reciprocating it, there's no sacrifice that's too great. You know what I mean? Because he gave up Jesus on the cross. And when he gave up Jesus, it's like, what's too great for you? Even dying on a cross doesn't come close to God's son dying on a cross. If I were to die on a cross, I'm like, man, not even a big deal. That come, doesn't even come close to, to his sacrifice. Now, it'd be very painful. You know what I mean? I'd be, it'd be crazy. But that kind of love is, is a love that when we're in touch with God's love, we have that heart for him. Amen? Amen. And so that's a, that's, that's a huge one. Secondly, here we see Jesus fired up. He goes to the temple courts. He sees all the corruption in the temple. And what does he do? He's, he's ticked off and he, he's angry that these guys are corrupting it and they got their own agenda. And so he sits there and he, he makes a whip and he puts it all together and it's this, this whip. And of course, he's not freaking out in a fit of rage, but we see a heart of his premeditation. He overturns the tables. And it's interesting on the sidelines, some are like, is that sin? Is that okay? Like, I think Jesus went over the top right here. Can't we just be friends? Can't we just talk about this? Why do you have to flip over the tables, Jesus? But it's interesting. What do the disciples remember? They're like, Old Testament scripture, zeal for your house will consume me. That's Jesus fulfilling zeal right there. Isn't that incredible? And I think, you know, Jesus is like, he saw this and we have to see zeal, Jesus being zealous and Jesus being zealous were one and the same. He goes and here's what zeal is. He goes inside the temple, sees the sin and says, get this out of here. Isn't that incredible? That's love for God. That's love for God's church. We're zealous for the church and we're saying there should be no idols in the church. There should be no corruption in the church. We can't tolerate sin in the church. Why? Because we love God like Jesus loves God. We were fired up about his people. And so when we see it, we say, get these, get this sin out of here. Amen? Amen. This was a man, Jesus, consumed with love. And I think that's where zeal and, and, and all of this comes from. It's zealous for God's church. Amen? Amen. Zealous for God's people. And uh, he was consumed. He had nothing but God in his soul. He wanted to clean it out. And I think, you know, for me, I I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my dad being zealous, right? Because like I shared, I was a follow-away in Los Angeles at the time. And my dad, I had gone and visited him in Tampa, Florida in the former fellowship. And by this time, uh, my sister had uh, fallen away with her husband uh, my little brother had gone into the Marines and was no longer going to church and became atheist. And now my youngest brother, Joseph, was, was uh, sneaking out in the middle of the night and going and partying with his friends in high school. And I'm a follower. And I go home to my dad and his church there in Tampa that had given up on discipling and, and had given up on the call of, of making disciples and, and, and calling everybody to follow Jesus' dream. And the church had become lukewarm. And so I go to my dad. I'm like, dad, do you think Joseph's a disciple? He's like, yeah. And I'm like, dad, he's not a disciple. And I'm a follower. I'm not a follower saying he's not a disciple. You know, and I knew his life. I knew Joey because we, we were talking. We were, he's my little brother. So my dad decides I got to do something radical to save my family. And he moves from Tampa to Portland, where there's a church of sold-out disciples, right, in 2005, 2006. And, and I was like, cool, they're on the West Coast. So I rode my motorcycle up there to visit. Uh, and I was like, oh, this is awesome. And, you know, this is like all the, the beginnings of the movement. And there's like all the, the, the leaders that you know of now, they're all in that little church, and they all looked really rough, you know. It was pretty bad. So who am I to talk about, though? I had like this long hair, and I was... <laughs> wearing leather from the motorcycle and people thought I was like a homeless guy, you know, but I was, <laughs> but no, no, I was, you know, I was 
Amen. I was Lance's son, I guess. Okay, so so I get there, and, and so I go back. I'm like, cool, my parents are on the West Coast. This is nice. And then I find out they're moving to Los Angeles. And so my parents and Joseph and, uh, and uh, 42 people came down from L.A. or from Portland to go play at the church in L.A. And the first thing I did was move as far as I could from the church. I was like, okay, I'm moving to Ventura right here, you know, which is like an hour and a half away. Uh, of course, Curtis and Morgan know Ventura pretty well. They led the church up there for a little while. Um, and so I'm in Ventura, and that's where all that happened that I just shared about. Um, and so it was, but it was amazing. My dad saw the church become lukewarm and decided I got to get radical right here. And so he moved to Portland. And then, of course, I get restored in uh, uh, L.A. when they came down there. Um, Joey was uh, now helping me be a disciple, which was awesome. And then uh, Joey gets sent out to go plant Brazil, uh, goes and leads in Mexico. And for me, I finally like started getting my act together, became the t- first team leader in Los Angeles, which is pretty awesome. And uh, the first guy I discipled was Darian Onakea, uh, Rob and Berg's son. So I was quickly pulled into the, the Hawaiian way of thinking and realized how inconsiderate I had been for so long uh, because Rob and Berg let me know. Uh, and it was good. It was very good. Um, crazy stories. But... But then I get sent out to New York and, and Chicago, and then we plant San Francisco, and then we go back to New York, and then we go back to Chicago, and then we go to LA. And the whole time, my dad's like, can I move to San Francisco? Can I move to New York? Maybe we should move to Chicago. And then we're in Minneapolis. He's like, let's go to Minneapolis with you guys. And, and every single time, it would never work out. And so, you know, I'm, I've kind of like grown up with my dad always wanting to join wherever we're at, but just knowing he needs to build LA because there's such a powerful uh, ministry couple. They've been around for so long. So guess what eventually, you know, eventually happened is uh, in a, something awesome. But, you know, in Kona, you know, talking with Dennis and Corinna, they're like, we God, we need uh, help in Kona. You know, we need support. What's going to happen? And so it's kind of like they've got gotten missed. And so, um, you know, it's on my heart and it's been on Tim's heart and um, and the leadership in LA's heart, even Kip's heart. And so finally there opens up a time where Joseph and his now wife Magnolia, uh, comes off of staff in LA and we're like, what if they were to lead the Kona church? And so, so, you know, I was like, I'm not sure. We're going to have to talk to Dennis Sakrina. We're going to have to talk to David and Beth. Um, well, Tim's like, well, first I got to talk to your mom and dad because they're going to lose their son. And Magnolia is due in May 25th with her first baby. So this is insane, you know? So um, Tim talks to my dad, and my dad says, no way could we, like, they're about to have a, a baby. There's no way they could go to Kona unless we go with them. <laughs> we sh- I should have seen it coming, you know? But, uh, but as Tim said, he's like, well, all right, let's try to make that happen, you know? And uh, we're like, whoa. So, you know, I was like, this is crazy. We talked to Kip, talked to Jason, who's now leading LA. Kip was fired up. Tim was fired up. Jason was fired up. My parents are fired up. Joseph and Magnolia are fired up. And so finally we're like, we're talking to Dennis. Dennis and Corinna are excited for it. David and Beth are fired up. And so we're like, yes, let's make this happen. Is that awesome? And so for the first time, you know, ever, my dad is leaving Los Angeles to come to the Big Island. Fired up. Um, And so now, but Magnolia is going to have a baby May 25th. So what is she going to do? Have a baby and just like sit around and, and like try to move with a newborn? I was like, I was like, no, no, no. You guys got to get here before the baby's born. You know what I mean? I was like, number one, because it's easier. But I think the bigger reason... Because after a year, you're going to wish your baby was born in Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to wish. Like, I told her, I was like, I've even thought about having a third child just to say I have a child born in, in Hawaii. <laughs> but I had to ask Brittany. You know what I mean? She's part of that plan. So, so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't maybe the best. We have two perfect kids right now. Um, so, so I'm like, guys, you need to get here before Maggie's due. But you can't fly like right before you're born, right, right before the baby's due. There's like four weeks. So that means they have to get here in April, yeah. which if you check, today's April 2nd, <laughs> right? So, but it all worked out. And so April 11th, Joseph and Magnolia are going to be moving to Kona. Oh. Is that crazy? <laughs> 
fired up. But I think that zeal, you know, that they have is just so cool to see that affecting now the Big Island as they're coming. And it, my parents, probably about four weeks later, will be coming out and being in Kona too. So it'll be Joseph and Magnolia. Then they're going to have a baby in May. And then uh, my parents, Lance and Connie, will be living in Kona as well. So uh, the Big Island just got a little bit bigger with my family coming there. So fired up. Um, but I think, you know, it's incredible that uh, as we're on this, this, this journey with God, you know, as God brings us to all these different places and, and we see new faces and incredible people and as our churches are growing because of God's love, uh, God has incredible plans for our life. And I told the Kona Church, we met with them Friday, everybody in Kona knows, and I told them, I'm just, I'm so grateful that they're accepting my family into their family. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just amazing. It's amazing. And of course, like by extension, the Hilo Church, you know, and uh, so now instead of going to Long Beach for Thanksgiving, I come to the Big Island for Thanksgiving, you know, you know, and, uh, so in Christmas, I guess. So uh, really excited about that. You know, it's awesome that God's zeal for us is a zeal that creates some conflict, like it did for me in the beginning, you know, as I was wrestling with the fact that I had left, but I, but God was calling me back to his kingdom and to commitment with him. But then through that, God continues to build our lives. You know what I mean? And I think for me, the greatest thing that God has allowed for me to do is just decide, you know what? Forget my life. I want to build God's church. Forget. I don't, I don't care if I, you know, have to just live in a brother's household in the ghetto for the rest of my life, which I did for a long time. You know what I mean? And I was like, maybe this is God's plan for my life. You know, um, I've lived in the ghetto in Brooklyn, New York City, in South Central LA, West Side Chicago. I've had cats living with me in my kitchen, and I didn't know where they were from. You know what I mean? They would, as soon as I walked to the kitchen, they'd hop out the window and, and go to the rest of their family. Um, I've had SWAT teams raid my neighbors, you know, pretty crazy stuff. Uh, but my other neighbor said, don't worry, I'm in, I'm in a gang, I'm a blood, so you're safe with me. And I was like, thanks, man, feel really good about that. Um, but, you know, uh, I've seen, you know, guys try to hold up armored cars and get shot and killed, you know. I mean, it's been, it's been incredible, you know, the places God sent me, but I didn't know at the end of that journey, you know, or a part of that journey, I'd be here sharing this in Big Island, you know what I mean? And just being able to say Hawaii is our home, you know? Um, so I'm excited for what God's doing. I'm excited for zeal. I want to, I think the practicals, you know, for this is just for us to have zeal for God too. You know, I think we're like, man, if I have zeal, what will I lose? But you'll lose everything. But then God will give you everything back and more. You'll lose, you know, like, like the, the plans you had, but God's plans are so much better, aren't they? Amen. And so when we have that zeal for God, when we have that jealousy for God like he has for us, God says, I have an incredible life in store for you. Amen? Amen. And so practically, you got to think, man, is there anything ticking God off of, uh, of, in my life? Any other idols in my life that I run to? You know, is there any grumbling that I have or, or anything like this that, that is, is making me, you know, angry or, or unhappy or distant. And I think, you know, ultimately God's trying to win us back. I think when I think of the Hilo church, I think of a church that has persevered, persevered in their zeal for God. Right. You know, I think like, man, some of the things that have happened, the transitions that have happened, uh, you know, I've, I've talked to a disciple, like, whoa, that's never happened to me right there, you know, with maybe a certain relationship or something like that. And just thinking, why is this church still here? Because there are disciples in here who are so zealous, they've persevered through some of the most intense attacks. I'm like, man, you guys are amazing. That's incredible. Like, the church is, is baptizing and growing, and it's like getting attacked from all angles, you know, for so many years. Yeah. And it's like, I just look at Hilo, I'm like, you guys are the real deal. Like, this is a group of gritty people right here. You know what I mean? And, and it's like, man, you come here and it's like a little scary because you feel like you're in a hall of legends right here. You know, people who like, you can't fake them out, right? There's nothing you can do. I, I'm like, I'm just going to come in here and tell you me because I don't have much else to offer you. You know what I mean? Uh, but because the Hilo church is an amazing church. And so I'm so proud of you guys. I'm so grateful for you guys. I'm so grateful for the heart, grateful to see uh, Mark and Quinn and Daryl get baptized, yeah. Jiro studying, uh, 
to see the Valdezes becoming part of the church and a part of the family is awesome. Uh, of course, I know that was like a year ago, so it's kind of, you know, old news. But for me, it's always good news because we, we love them so much when we were back in Los Angeles with them. Uh, Morgan gave me my first SCOBY to make my first kombucha, uh, which was very life-changing in my life and, and in the smell of our kitchen as well. But... Um, but I just want to share, it's so awesome to be here. I want to come here as much as I can, hopefully like once a month or once every couple months, me and Brittany will be out visiting and speaking and being with the church. But uh, I'm just, just grateful that you guys are holding it down in such a great city and you're, you're advancing. You're, you're, you're doing awesome stuff. So it's sad I couldn't say that to David and Beth with them here because I know they're the leaders of this thing and they've, they've put their heart and soul into things. But uh, so grateful for each one of you and grateful you guys would allow me to speak right now. So anyway, amen. I hope that uh, that fires you up about God to know his zeal and his jealousy for you. And uh, that will make us even more zealous and jealous of God as well. Thank you. And to God be all the glory.